About 50 years ago, armed with the very latest deep space measuring tools, astrophysicist Vera Rubin went about an ambitious task to clear up some uncertainty about the rotation of spiral galaxies in the universe. But her data, Rubin noticed, wasn't clearing things up. The Andromeda galaxy was telling her that it just didn't need to obey the basic laws of motion. Rubin looked at another galaxy and saw the same defiance. And another, and another, 60 in all. Every galaxy she measured told her there was something wrong with the basic mechanics of the universe. For a lone astrophysicist, having to explain this was a terrifying thought. What Rubin had discovered, though, was what some scientists now theorise to be dark matter. Her observations imply there was an invisible form of matter that fills all of space, something no one has seen or produced direct evidence of, yet is believed to make up most of the matter in the universe. What did Rubin observe? Only that 400 years of observation was wrong and that what astronomer Johann Kepler first observed as a delicate balance of work in the solar system was completely out of whack for galaxies everywhere in the universe. Kepler tells us that the sun's gravity pulls things in that move past it. Move too slowly, the sun swallows them up. Too fast, and the sun's gravity can't hold on. When the motion of the planet and the gravity of the sun are balanced, then a stable orbit becomes the planet's pathway around the sun. But when things are spinning, there's a different calculation we can make about the relationship between two objects. Spin a heavy object around, the faster you spin it, the heavier it seems. Spin it fast enough, and the object pulls so hard, its force overwhelms us. We lose control, and it flies away. And it's in this way that Rubin's galaxies behave strangely. The stars on the outside were spinning so quickly that based off the observable mass, there was no way, by the laws of physics, they could be kept from spinning off like that ball, tearing apart the galaxy altogether. It could very well be that our understanding of the basic mechanics of the universe need to be revised. But Rubin realised there was another possibility to consider. If there was more mass than she could account for, a lot more, for holding everything together, the stars in the outer arms of her galaxies could move that quickly and yet stay intact. She looked for the missing mass. She could not find it. Something that acts on all the observable matter in the universe, but we can't find it? Was it even findable? Or was this something exotic that threatened to explode all of physics? The hunt was on. In the 50 years since Rubin's discovery, scientists have puzzled over possible theories of dark matter. The most likely contender is that it is made of a fundamental particle, just like regular matter is. If so, how will we find it? What if we don't? Or what if it's not a particle at all? Welcome to the elusive darkness of the universe. But before we start, let me do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we want to recognise and pay respect to the first scientists and acknowledge the important contribution this unique wisdom provides to contemporary scientific conversations and collaborations. We acknowledge the deep and timeless relationship between country and Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples and pay respect to the elders of the communities and extend recognition to their descendants, both past and present. Now, dark matter is a subject dear to my heart. I did one of my first stories for the ABC on dark matter. And at the time, the scientist I was interviewing, he said to me, look, everything we know about the galaxy, all the stars we've studied, all the planets, all the gases, everything there, only makes up 15% of what's in the galaxy, this tiny fraction. Everything else is invisible. We have no idea what it is. And he saw it as a bit of an embarrassment, really. He said, you know, if you're a bird scientist, an ornithologist, it's like saying, well, I know everything about birds, but really all I know about is the eye. You know, I know nothing about the rest of the bird. So he was pretty keen to sort it out. That was some time ago, uh, and we're still, we really don't know what it is. So hopefully we can unpick a few things and find out a bit more about it in this session. So let me introduce the panelists. 
First, we have Catherine Fries. Uh, she's done a massive amount of work to try to identify the nature of dark matter and dark energy, as well as build a successful model of the early universe. We have Nicole Bell, uh, whose research lies at the interface of particle physics, astrophysics and cosmology. Very interesting intersection there. And we have Lindsay Bignall, who is a particle physicist who builds experiments which hope to detect and measure dark matter. Welcome, everyone. Very much looking forward to this discussion. Hey, look, before we start, maybe you could just, in 30 seconds or less, uh, give me a brief background as to what you do relevant to dark matter. So we start with you, Katie. Let me just say I'm so happy to be here today. And my field is theoretical cosmology. So I work on particle astrophysics, the smallest particles of the universe, explaining the biggest properties of astronomy, the largest things in the universe. And I was very lucky to be around at the infancy of this field. And so we were able to make some of the calculations that got people started in building detectors to look for dark matter. Ah, very exciting. So yeah, it'll be interesting to hear some of that history as we go along here. Uh, Nicole, a bit more background on you? I'm a theorist who works on the intersection between particle physics and astrophysics and cosmology. So I work on descriptions of what dark matter can be and how we can go and test our theories for what dark matter can be in experiments that are operating around the world, including in Australia, um, and also how we can use astrophysics and cosmology observations to learn about dark matter as well. Okay, and, and Lindsay, you're an experimentalist, unlike the other two. Yeah, I'm an experimental particle physicist, so I build the detectors that hope to search for dark matter. So I'm involved in a couple of uh, collaborations at the moment, uh, one of which is SABRE, which will be the first uh, dark matter experiment that we will build and operate in Australia. So what they say about you theorists and experimentalists is not true, right? You all get on really well. Yeah, no comment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave that alone then. We'll take that as a yeah. <laughs> okay. So look, we, we saw in the little video package that, you know, the earliest evidence for dark matter was the fact that galaxies weren't spinning properly. It seems that you needed a whole lot more matter in there to provide the extra gravity to hold everything together. Katie, but what, what other evidence do we have these days that dark matter must be there? Must it be there? Are you sure? I would say yes. So the first evidence for this started in 1930. So this is a 90 year old problem. And yeah, we, it became clear from the work of Vera Rubin that you just can't ignore it. We have to understand what is pulling on the other light matter in the universe. So another way to go after it, I mean, there's so many ways, so many pieces of evidence that we have that it has to be there. One of them is gravitational lensing. So the idea here is that mass bends light. This was a prediction of Albert Einstein's in 1915, almost immediately proven true. And so if you have some big mass of dark matter somewhere, it's not giving off light itself, but it'll bend the light that comes from behind it. And that's called gravitational lensing. And so what that means is that instead of, instead of seeing a star where it's supposed to be, you would see multiple images of it, and those images would be sheared. And so I love this slide because it turns out there's an app on your iPhone that has the correct equations for gravitational lensing. It was written by a graduate student. And so you can take that app and lens yourself more and more and more. You can see how the images are distorted. And so by looking at, um, well, not students, but looking at distant galaxies, you can figure out, aha, uh -huh, so there's some Hubble Space Telescope data. So there, this is, you can see those sheared multiple images of actually several background objects. And starting from those sheared background images, you can figure out what dark matter had to be on the way in between those distant galaxies and us. And so if you do that with a computer reconstruction, then you'll get the next image. And, and it looks something like this. So this shows you where the mass has to be. And so in this particular case, you have a cluster of galaxies. And so if you reconstruct all the mass on the way in between the distant galaxies and you, you'll see that there's those peaks in there. So there's lots of galaxies in there, but in between the galaxies, there's more dark matter. So even clusters of galaxies in between the galaxies, there's all this mass that's pulling on the light that you see. So that's, that's uh, that was. 
I was going to say, so, I mean, that's pretty powerful evidence. I mean, you've got the evidence that the galaxies aren't spinning correctly, but you've also got this evidence that there's something out there, even though we can't see it, but it's bending the light, right? It's gravitational influence is bending the light. So that's, that's pretty strong yeah. evidence, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lindsay, is, is there other evidence uh, for dark matter that we have? Yeah, there's, there's lots of evidence. I mean, there's um, evidence in cosmology um, and there's uh, you know, evidence in, in other fields. I mean, maybe Nicole or, or Catherine as the theorists are probably the people that are, that are best to talk about it. But I mean, yeah, it's pretty much everywhere we look in the galaxy and in the universe, there's just too much gravity for what we can see based on the stars and the, the visible objects that, are, that we can see through telescopes. Okay. You know, another one that I love is the bullet cluster. This is a really, this is such a weird object. So if uh, we could have the slide for the bullet cluster, there you go. So this is really something. So you, there are two clusters that are in the process of merging. So they had a collision. So, so what and when they, the collision happened. What, what's the cluster there? Can you just give us a bit, bit of background on that? What's happening there? Yeah, there's actually two clusters that collided with each other. And when the collision happened, the ordinary matter, which you can see in pink, that got, that got stuck because, you know, if you and I hit each other, we collide, we're not going very far. So that's what happened. It gives off x-rays is how you see it. But then the dark matter behaved differently. You've got some stuff that kept going and guess what? It's that same lensing that we use to find there's, there's, there's this other matter there. So isn't that weird? You have atomic matter, the gas gets stuck, but then you have this other stuff that keeps going. So we can really see there's just more than one type of matter. And the dark matter is just different from the ordinary gas that we're used to. Nicole, do, do you want to check the, some other evidence you'd like to talk about for dark matter? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the evidence is, is now overwhelming. It doesn't matter on what length scale of the universe we talk about, whether it's our own galaxy or clusters or galaxies or the universe as a whole on all of these different length scales, you look at the evidence and you conclude there has to be dark matter there to make sense of the observations. We get galaxies in the present day universe, we can study the cosmic microwave background, which is, a, which is a snapshot of the early universe. No matter what time scale or epoch in the universe we're looking at, we reach the same conclusion. And so this really consistent picture has been built up now where there, there really has to be dark matter or, or something that very much like it. Um, so this is a this on the screen here we see the cosmic microwave background, which is a snapshot of the universe when it was about three hundred thousand years old, mm -hmm. and the colours are hot spots and cold spots, um, corresponding to over densities and under densities, and these over densities and under densities seeded the growth of structure to give you the the structures we see in the universe today. But in order for this picture to make sense and evolve from this early state of the universe into the one that we do observe today, you absolutely have to put dark matter into your calculations and simulations to get it all to work out. Um, with a quantity of dark matter and the properties of dark matter that are consistent um, with all the other evidence for dark matter. Um, but this, this CMB is, is really, really nice because it tells us some of the most precise things we know about how much dark matter there is compared to the amount of regular matter. Okay, I'll just jump in there. So an acronym warning. So CMB, that's Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, right? Exactly. Cosmic Microwave Background, yes. And, that, and that's... So that's, that's, that's uh, you, can think that as, you can think of that as the leftover light from the Big Bang. Okay, so the leftover light from the Big Bang has these sort of hot spots and co hotter spots and cooler spots, and that's what causes sort of the big galaxies and the clusters of galaxies to collapse out of that. Is that right? Um, you know, I wouldn't put it that way. It's more that they're, they're, the hot spots and cold spots in the light correspond to regions of the universe that have more matter in them and less matter in them. So where there's more matter in some region, that's going to keep grabbing more and more and more matter and make galaxies. And it also distorts the light that comes through it. So there's, there's, a, there's a connection between the light and the mass. And it all stems from the very early universe that there were, there were seeds for both of these things very, very early on, and they talk to each other. Uh -huh. 
Fascinating. Hey, um, Nicole, just before we go any further, I mentioned dark energy early on, in, in fact, in reference to Katie's work, but um, maybe we should clear up that little thing because, you know, people get those two things confused, dark energy and dark matter. Can you just run us through what the, what's going on and what are the differences? Well, dark energy and dark matter behave very differently. They're both dark, but the, the, the similarity pretty much stops there. Um, Dark matter is like the matter we know and love. It just doesn't emit light, but you know it probably consists of particles in the same sense that the you know you and I are made out of particles. Dark energy is something very di different. You should, in some sense, think about it as the energy of empty space, and it, it's a nice name. Um, in fact, I Einstein originally proposed dark energy. It was, it was called something else then. It was called the cosmological constant, um, which he originally left out of his equations and then added later in a court he was uh, but in, in any case um dark energy and dark matter behave in a very different way and if we look at there's a pie chart i think in the slides which tell us about the composition of the universe okay so this is, this is actually most of the this is not the composition of the galaxy right this is the composition of the universe which is this is this is the energy budget for the whole universe yeah. um in fact there's more dark energy than there is dark matter at the moment this is a uh, this is the composition in the present day in the past it will be different in the future it will be different again but at the moment it looks like this with this sort of roughly a quarter in the form of dark matter um and a large fraction in the form of dark energy as we go forward in time in fact the dark energy proportion of the universe but the dark energy proportion of this pie chart will grow um but at the moment this is what it looks like and we can break it up into dark energy and dark matter because they behave very differently Okay, so we've got so sort of may if I may Yeah. I was if say, I may interject You oh, speak. Please go ahead. This Zoom connection's hard. You speak. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So the by the definition of matter is that it feels gravitational attraction. So galaxies are held together by gravity. And so that's why both ordinary matter and dark matter, they feel gravity. But this thing that we call dark energy is the opposite. It's causing the universe expansion to accelerate. It has some kind of repulsive behavior. It's pushing stuff apart from everything else. So it couldn't be more different in terms of how it affects the universe. What is it, um, maybe a question to all of you, about these unusual names that astrophysicists have for things like dark matter, dark energy, white dwarf, red giant. It's a very colourful kind of discipline, um, astronomy and astrophysics. Maybe you'd all be in marketing or advertising if you weren't astrophysicists. I don't know. Well, I'll put that to you. <laughs> no need to answer that. Let's, <laughs> let's move on. Um, and look, maybe we'll... Um, who would like to talk to, uh, to machos and wimps? I mean, that's another one of these examples of these great, great terminology. You know, this, <laughs> this story when I, that I first did on dark matter, I thought, what does the machos, what's the other theory? Wimps, of course it is. So there, are, there were two ideas, certainly in the days that I first heard about it, that could explain dark matter. Who would like to tell me what's the difference between a, a macho and a wimp? Well, Katie? I can do that because I've worked, I worked on both sides of this debate. And so the machos are the massive, compact, halo objects. And we thought they were, well, actually, I never really believed it, but people thought, OK, it's not bright stars, but what if dark matter is made of faint stars or substellar objects or white dwarfs or something like that? And well, with a series of arguments, a combination of theory and data, so I was one of the people who, who showed that, well, it's not going to work. So machos, the, the faint stars are 3% of our galaxy and, and, and so on. It just doesn't work. OK, so we are going to have some fun here because we have the machos versus the wimps. And the wimps are the, the, the wimps won. interacting massive. The wimps won. So I like to say machos are dead, desperately looking for wimps. Hey, Lindsay, are you, I mean, can you tell it what, what is a wimp? Uh, so WIMP is an acronym for a weakly interacting massive particle. So it's a it's a candidate for what dark matter could actually be as a new type of particle. 
So, I mean, you know, the, the theory is that, you know, very early on in the universe, the WIMPs were made along with all the other particles. And just because they interact so feebly with ordinary matter, we just haven't detected them yet. We haven't sensed them, but they have mass. So they influence uh, all of the other things in the universe through the gravity that they, that they exert. And so, you know, uh, you know, my role is to try and build detectors to, to look for WIMPs. Okay, N Nicole, I mean, can you add a bit more there about WIMPs? I mean, why, why WIMPs? Why, why that kind of particle? Well, WIMPs are by far the most studied theoretical idea. And there's this nice, there's this nice concept called the WIMP miracle, which is part of why we like them. Um, so, so dark matter is dark, right? We, we don't, it doesn't interact very much, but we have some ideas about how strongly it ought to interact. It turns out, you know, if, if it interacted a lot, first of all, we would have seen it. Um, but also if it interacted a lot, it, probably most of it would have annihilated and gone away long ago. Um, and if it interacted too feebly, in fact, we might have too much of it left around. And so there's some happy medium um, whereby how strongly the dark matter interacts tells you something about how much of it we have in the universe today. And for a particle that interacts weakly, a heavy particle that interacts weakly sits in that sweet spot where you naturally get the amount of dark matter we see in the universe today. And there were a bunch of ideas floating around in the theoretical community about why it might be natural in some sense to have heavy, weakly interacting particles. Um, uh, new heavy interacting particles and so these, these ideas fitted together and, and and people liked it a lot um but it's really this miracle um that these heavy weakly interacting particles can naturally explain how much dark matter there is in the universe today which makes them such a compelling idea theoretically i mean why why did it, they seem a natural fit i think katie wants to jump in yeah please do yeah so, so if we go back to this, we're thinking about this bullet cluster about how ordinary matter has lots of interactions. So it has electromagnetism. So you and I, we have strong forces that hold our nuclei together. And there's, of course, gravity. Well, there's four fundamental forces. And if we postulate that the dark matter doesn't feel electromagnetism or the strong interactions, well, there's still one force left, and that is the weak force. And so by the weak force, this is something that's responsible for some types of radioactivity. So it is one of the possible, well, no, it is a, one of the known four fundamental forces of nature. So let's postulate that we have a particle hole that doesn't have any of these other forces, but it does have, it does feel the weak force. And if you do that, then you automatically do the calculations for how many existed in the early universe, how many are left today, and you automatically come out with the right number. And the only ingredient put into the calculation is that they interact via the weak force. Okay, and that's, that, um, I assume that's um, really a powerful reason for thinking there might be something in this, right? If you only have to fiddle with one or two parameters and you've got a natural fit versus having to fiddle with a lot of parameters. Well, as some of them, they are, they are their own annihilation. They're, they are their own antimatter, and so they annihilate among themselves. And if you find that the right amount is left today, that's called the WIMP miracle. So that's why we think that they're really powerful candidates. The WIMP miracle. I like that. Yeah. Um, I was going to, well, well, we've got you there, Katie. So, so in the last few years, we've discovered a whole new lot of black holes through gravita uh, gravitational wave detection. Does that, does that uh, reinvigorate the macho theory, for example? Might they have another chance to, to win the fight? I mean, black holes presumably were part of those other big objects they were looking for, right? Actually, there's a, a slightly different type of black hole that's become really interesting, and that's the primordial black holes. And so these are black holes that would have formed in the early universe, and they're for example, when there, there's transitions in the early universe and suddenly you get regions that have a lot of extra matter in them and those regions collapse in on themselves and you make black holes really, really early on. So these primordial black holes would be interesting candidates to explain these gravitational wave scenarios we've seen. And some of the same techniques that you would l use to look for machos, no machos are not the dark matter, but the primordial black holes could be. And so some of those same techniques are being used again to look for primordial black holes.
So that would be quite a different explanation, right? That's not a particle then. You're talking about big, I'm you know, sure they're invisible, but great big objects. Uh, you know, they're, they're, yes. I mean, they could be, their they're mass, they're mass range, it could be anything. I mean, so the, the, they could be, I think the ones that are the, as massive as the sun probably don't work, but they don't, I don't know, the mass of the earth or something that could be. So they're, yeah, some of them, some of them could definitely be explaining the dark matter. Okay, interesting. So that's another way we might uh, be able to search for dark matter then is looking for gravitational waves, they might admit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the mergers of black holes that give gravitational waves. And yeah. so these gravitational wave detectors have, have, are, are seeing them. They're finding new ones all the time, these merger events. Okay, Lindsay, um, there's an, another candidate, an axion, right? Tell us about those. Yeah, so, uh, so I mean, the axion is, is another particle candidate. So it's, it's proposed uh, because of... Uh, you know, this, this um, observation that we have of the way that the strong force behaves. Uh, you know, there's this, this freedom for the strong force to, to not conserve this symmetry known as CP, uh, and, and, but we observe that it does experimentally. So we don't know why. And something that particle theorists often do is they, you know, if they see something that, you know, looks like it's uh, an extra symmetry, then they can, uh, create a new field and a new particle associated with that. And so the axion is the natural candidate to explain, um, you know, the, the, the CP conservation within the strong interactions. And so uh, it's a much, you know, from a, from a detector experimentalist point of view, it's a very different sort of detector you build to look for an axion than, than for a WIMP. So it's, it's a very light particle and it has a, um, it, it has this uh, interaction with, with electromagnetism that you can use to, to build detectors. Okay, we probably don't want to get into the depths of a yeah, CP so axions, violation. Yeah, so axions, but, wait. But I was going to say, is it, just to summarise in, so it, does, it, it basically the theories are sort of showing that there could be a particle like an axion, right, that, that would serve the same purposes, is that right, because of the, of the way, of symmetries of the theory? Yeah, Katie, did you want to jump in? No, 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 that's fine. You, yeah, exactly. He, uh, this is what, what you've been saying exactly, so I completely agree. I was just going to say the axions are a lot lighter than WIMPs. So WIMPs weigh more, they weigh around the same as protons, 100 times as much as protons, but the axions are a trillion times lighter or more. So they're very different particles and very different ways of looking for them. And what, what would be the favorite candidate at the moment? Would it be the WIMP, the axion? Oh, you might get 10 different answers I'm from hoping. 10 different people. <laughs> for, for a long time, it, it was WIMPs, um, but WIMPs were motivated by some things like supersymmetry and other theoretical ideas um, for which we haven't yet found any experimental evidence. So perhaps the time of the WIMP is waning. Um, certainly people are now looking for light WIMPs, um, which is maybe still be a wimp, um, but, but perhaps the theoretical motivation is different. But there are so many candidates. There are the axions, there are sterile neutrinos. There's so many different theoretical ideas that we need to test. It seems the key thing to me. I'm a, I'm a wimp experimentalist, so I'm hoping that it's a wimp. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what, what... Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the, on the theoretical side, there's only two well-motivated candidates, wimps and axions, maybe primordial black holes. All this, all, the, all, everything else is... Ah, if you can look for it, yes, but the theoretical motivation is just not as strong. So I'm with you. Keep looking for wimps, please. And to be, maybe I would add is the thing to do. I think Axion needs a better acronym. You know, how can you compete with WIMP? You, know? you need something better than that, I think. But I'll leave that to you guys. Um, I mean, just to get a feel for it. So we've got if, if we're talking wimps, for example, then they're passing through most of matter most of the time, right? I mean, they're passing through me at the moment, are they? Um, you know, a, a reporter asked me this question, and so we actually did the math and wrote a paper. Oh, so really? Are, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. I, was, I had the wrong idea. So there's a billion passing through your body every second, and about, it depends on the details of which of, of the WIMP interactions, okay, but roughly somewhere between one a day or one a month hits one of your nuclei 
And I used to think it was less often, so I used to joke it's the death theory when it hits your nucleus, you die. But given that it's <laughs> that you're getting hit on a daily basis, I guess it's, I was wrong about that. <laughs> Gee, but so, still, so, a billion a second for yeah. going through your body, that's a lot. That is a lot. That is a lot that you're completely unaware of. But, but every now and then, one, what is a direct hit with a nucleus in one of your atoms that will cause an interaction of some sort. Is that right? Yep. And not do me any harm. Same interaction. <laughs> no, no. You know, if cosmic rays hurt you. So especially if you go on airplanes, there's all this electromagnetic radiation that mm. flying around the galaxy that can be quite dangerous for, uh, for cancer or, or whatever. And it's one of the reasons that astronauts are going to have trouble going too far. They have to figure out how to handle the radiation from cosmic rays. But no, wimps are harmless. Wimps are harmless. I thought they would be. They sound harmless. Hey, all right. So I'm going to open up. And Lindsay is looking for it. It's using the same idea, the same interaction they have in the nuclei in your body. It's the same thing Lindsay's looking for in, in uh, d underground detectors. Yeah. And actually, we're going yeah, to come, I mean, come I think, to that. I think your point, your paper must, illust it, it really illustrates the challenge, right? With detecting wimps. You know, we yeah. get one per day for, for the billions that are passing through our body. So, you know, imagine trying to build a detector that can pick up on that one and measure that one per day when there's all these other particles that are around us all the time that are, you know, interacting many, many times per second. Um, and so this this is kind of illustrates the the scale of the challenge, I think. Yeah, and look, we're going to move on I have to say it's mind-boggling how well you guys are doing. It's just mind, these guys, are, these experiments are mind-boggling. You guys are fantastic. Yeah, we're yeah. going to talk yeah, about I mean, I think those a lot in of, a second. A lot of people have come before me. <laughs> yeah, and you're not using human bodies to do the te detection, right? No, no, we make terrible wimp detectors. We're far too radioactive. <laughs> That's good to hear. Hey, look, I want to, just before we move on to the detectors, and I'm very keen to do that, I want to get a bit of speculation in here, if you'll forgive me. I know you, you, know, you don't like doing this, but so the ordinary matter world is full of a whole bunch of different particles that form molecules and they form planets and stars and this whole exotic world we know about. I mean, in principle, could the dark matter world be something similar where, you know, it's not just one particle, it's a whole lot of particles. They form more complex particles. You know, maybe there are dark matter planets out there, you know, that, that really wouldn't be out there, would they? They'd be here. They'd be sort of around us, whizzing through us. <laughs> Anyone like to comment on any of that? Oh, look, it's probably more complicated than a single particle. The, the visible spectra has, uh, yeah, we have, we have multiple particles that we can see. There's probably a whole dark a dark sector with not one dark matter particle, but lots of different sorts of dark matter particles. Maybe it's dominated by one, but it's, we'll see. Could there be dark planets and dark people playing dark football? Uh, you know, I don't know. I like the dark sector. So That's Graham, another great word. We're going to turn you we're going to turn you into a theorist, Graham, because you're getting good ideas here. Yeah, yeah, right. I'll, I'll, don't publish that. Leave that one to me, okay? Um, all right. Well, uh, we know something about the distribution of dark matter in our, in our galaxy, right? We, we see the visible disk, which is a disk, and we know where the dark matter is is located. It's located in a, a spherical halo. So it, it's not the, the dark, whatever's happening in the dark sector is not an exact copy of what's happening in the visible sector. The, the location of the, the dark stuff and the visible stuff is different. Um, I have to jump in. We've we got you Look off at the side, me. That, All right. <laughs> that spiral structure, that, that thing that looks like a pinwheel, that's where the disk of the galaxy, that's where the sun is, that's where all the light is coming from, and then this all this giant stuff out here, that's where the dark matter is. So this definitely, definitely different behavior. Okay, so the dark sector is, the dark aliens are a long way away from us in some sense, at least. Look, I'll move back to more sensible things now. Um, so, Lindsay, maybe you could tell me a bit about the detection. I mean, so, you know, the basic thing you think is, well, look, dark matter passes through ordinary matter almost all the time. Isn't it going to just pass straight through your detectors almost all the time? Almost all the time, but, but uh, maybe not all the time. <laughs> so, hopefully not all the time. So, I mean... You know, this is this is the challenge. And and when you're building a WIMP detector in particular, you what you're hoping to see is the, the dark matter scattering from one of the nuclei in the detector. So just like a, a billiard ball, you know, hitting another um, another pool ball like at a pool table, it'll just scatter, right? Transfer some momentum to the nucleus, the nucleus recoil, and then you can see that in your detector. So the challenge is all of the noise, right? All of the background events 
that occur in the detector all the time from the cosmic rays, from the naturally occurring backgrounds, you know, we're bathed in particle radiation all the time. So, you know, the, the way that we reduce this um, is we need to go firstly to build a lab that's deep enough underground that we can screen out all of the cosmic rays, the high energy cosmic rays that would need a lot of shielding to stop. We can stop that with about a kilometer of rock. And so we go deep underground, uh, you know, we're, we're building a lab in Australia in a, in a gold mine about a kilometer underground. So, I mean, and there's underground labs all around the world that, that do this as well. Yeah, so here's some pictures of, of the, the lab that we're building in Australia. Um, and so this, this lab that, that's currently under construction will house dark matter experiments as well as other experiments where you need to reduce this background of cosmic rays. So then, you know, the other thing that you've got to do though is, is you've got to build a detector that has no or as little as possible naturally occurring radioactivity because everything has some trace amount of, you know, uranium or thorium or the other naturally occurring radioactive isotopes that are present. So you need to build ultra, ultra pure materials that have no background or as little as possible background radioactivity. And so this, this requires a lot of like technical development of, of detectors to, to try and force this background as low as possible. So we can search for these really rare dark matter scattering events. Um, and then of course, the final thing is you've got to then protect that very sensitive detector from, you know, radioactive things that might be nearby, like the walls of the, of the lab or, or us, right? So um, you've got to shield the detector by, as, as well as you can from all of that other stuff that's around. It sounds like a really, really, really difficult experiment to do. I'll, I'll put in another yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And people have been working on this for about 30 years or so now. Um, and, you know, I think the progress that we have made in improving the sensitivity of searching for dark matter with, with increasing, you know, increasingly better detectors it has been remarkable. You know, it's gone, if you, if you plot it over time, it's gone at a rate faster than Moore's law, right? Which is the, how fast computers have increased in speed. You know, we've, we've, we've actually beaten, beaten that in terms of searching for dark matter. So, um, you know, it's been a really uh, remarkable achievement you know, the, the, the best, um, the current sort of leading experiment that we have um, is, is called Xenon 1 ton. So, um, so Xenon uh, is a, a, a liquid Xenon detector. So Xenon is normally a gas, so you have to cool it down to cryogenic temperatures. And, and this experiment, what it does is it looks for um, nuclear recoils in, in this Xenon mass that they have. And they've got about a tonne just over a ton of xenon in their detector. Um, and they, you know, the xenon, when the nucleus recoils, the way that you can measure that is you, you look for a little flash of light for scintillation um, from the nuclear recoil energy deposit. And then they, um, the, the, the nucleus will, or the, the recoiling light you can, you can pick up with very sensitive um, photon detectors and, you know, based on sort of analyzing the signals, you can, you can screen out backgrounds further as well. And so, so they've, they've reported results that are sort of, they see 700 or so background events in their detector per day, uh, oh, sorry, not per day, per year, which is an incredibly crazy low number. So, so um, you that, know, this that's is the consistent with background. Right, yeah, that's what, that's what they, they found, but, but it's consistent with other things in the background that are causing that rather than dark matter so far. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think they have backgrounds from, you know, gamma rays that they don't stop or uh, neutrons and, and things like this that, that might sneak in past their shielding and, and so on. So, I mean, the, it's, it's consistent with their backgrounds and extremely low backgrounds. So, you know, we would have in our bodies many, many more than 700 events per second going on so this is this is over a ton of material per year um and so it's it's a remarkable achievement um you know i guess there's, there's been a lot of and then this has been most of the dark matter experiments you know they've, they've measured nothing and so we're very good at measuring nothing um there's been one experiment that i suppose we should talk about which is uh the dharma experiment which is another wimp experiment that has claimed to measure something 
So, so this is, you know, the sole experiment that has kind of claimed to detect dark matter. Um, and so Dharma is a sodium iodide crystal experiment. So it's a different material from, from this xenon experiment. And it's seen, and, and we can see this on this slide, um, on the right, you can see their data um, from their experiment. And so what they measure is at the low energy events in their detector, which is where you would expect the, the dark matter scattering from nuclei. Um, they see over time, so that as you as you can see, they've been measuring since 1996, and they've, they've actually got even more data than this plot now. But um, you know, they see this annual change in the rate of events in their detector, and it looks you know very much like a sine wave, um, which is exactly what we'd predict um, the the WIMP signal to look like. You know, we'd expect it to change throughout the year, and this is actually you know Katie's done the seminal work on this so i mean i don't know if you want to jump in here and yeah well, i will talk about annual modulation so is that so is that the idea that this sort of like we're moving through a sea of wimps and because the earth is spinning around the sun like that and the sun's moving around you get that seasonal effect tell me more katie yeah so if you can put that if we go back to that picture the, on the on the left there so the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy so the wimps are moving in all different directions but because we are moving in a circle around the center of the galaxy, it, always, it looks like we're moving into a wind of wimps. It's kind of like when you're driving, it looks like the rain's coming at your windshield, but that's only because you're driving into it. So the same thing is true here that, that we're moving into this wind of wimps. And on top of that, the earth moves around the sun. And so the, the wind looks a little different at different times of year of the year. So what we, what we predicted, and this was, uh, you can see how long ago this was, uh, the references on here, 1986. So we predicted that you should get an, a largest count rate in June, and then you should get the lowest count rate in December. And lo and behold, that's exactly what Dama has. And they have a lot more data than this at this point. They've got, I don't know, 13 years of data of, of actual cycles or, or, or more than that even. And so, they definitely have an annual modulation. And so the question is, are they seeing wimps or are they seeing something else? And that is where things get very puzzling. We don't know. So I can keep talking about this, but. <laughs> well, I was going to get, I'll get in the cold to jump in. I'll get in the cold to jump in there because yeah. there's, this, there's this a dark the matter experiment. Yeah, I was going to say there's a dark matter experiment that's going to start in Australia, right? And that is trying to see if that's a real result, correct? Tell me about that. And, and, and that's what makes our experiment in Australia unique. We, we, we absolutely need to know whether Dharma saw a dark matter signal or something else. And the way to test it is to repeat the experiment in the opposite hemisphere. So to have a, a northern hemisphere that's Dharma and the southern hemisphere that, that, that that's us in Australia. And the reason being is that if this were a genuine dark matter signal, you see the same thing in, the, in both hemispheres at the same time. But if it was something else that you know, goes up and down according to the seasons, perhaps because there's some temperature dependent effect, which is different in the summer and the winter, then we'll be seeing different things in the northern and southern hemispheres. Um, but if, if it all lines up and it oscillates, the signal goes up and down, up and down, exactly the same in the southern hemisphere as it does in the northern hemisphere, that would almost be a smoking gun. That, uh, this could be dark matter after all. Um, so this, this is a test that really needs to be done and it has to be done in the southern hemisphere, which is why the, the SABRE experiment in Australia is going to be so important. And so tell me about that. The That's... Dama's in Italy. Yeah, and, and, the, and the Australian one is in stall, is that right? Tell me, how far progressed is that? Well, Lindsay showed us the pictures of, a, um, of the underground lab, which is coming along, and the experiment, well, well actually, Lindsay's on the experiment, so Lindsay used to say, but, you know, they're there, they're gearing up to have it down in the mine in the, in the very near-term future. Oh, very exciting. Yeah, I mean, we... We aim to be starting uh, at the end of this year or by the end of this year. I'm not sure of the exact dates, but you know the the lab the lab's nearly done, uh, I, I, and you know we've got a lot of the the components of the experiment are, are sort of coming together uh, behind the scenes. The stuff that can be done above ground, we, we're kind of doing, and so yeah, it's it's a really exciting time. Excellent. Hey, 
um, Katie. So can I ask a question? I, can yeah. I ask a question to Lindsay? What I, I'm guessing it'll take about five years for you to get the sensitivity to prove that Dama was right or wrong. Is that about the right kind of time frame? Uh, we think that so so scientists talk in terms of sigma for, for everyone else's benefit. So the, the the uncertainty that we have in our experiments can be described as a standard deviation on the the measurement that we make. And so you know we think that we can get to about three sigma in three years. So this is this is enough to you know typically we'd want to get to five sigma for claiming a discovery. Um, so we'd need a little longer to get to five sigma. But we think we can get to the this this three sigma level, which is often used to, as a threshold for, you know, a, a hint of a detection in three years. So, so three sigma Great. means it's probably a fairly low chance it's just a fluke. Five sigma means it's almost impossible that it's a fluke. Would that be in simple and layman's terms? Yeah. Excellent. So, so Katie, I'll just put it. So, the uh, the xenon experiments didn't discover anything, and this, the only experiment that's found a result is this Dharma experiment and that's we're not sure about that yet. Is it disturbing to you as a theoretician that they're doing these amazing experiments and turning up nothing? So there, that is a weird question. Why does one experiment see something and the others don't? And it's really a question of apples and oranges. So in order to really compare the results of something made of xenon with something made of sodium iodide, if you want to do it, then we can put in, we can give you some theory so you can make that comparison. So if it's the, simple, the vanilla case is called spin independent. If you do that, then the xenon experiments totally rule out DAMA. In fact, DAMA is not even consistent itself anymore with that vanilla interpretation. But the reality is there is some, there is still some uncertainty as to exactly what the theory is, both on the particle physics side and also on the nuclear physics side, we don't, there's some nuclear physics of this of the experiment. So sodium iodide, and and they even have a bit of a thallium in there. And so those, the, so the, the the both the particle physics of the interactions and the nuclear physics of the detectors could be different between these different experiments. So apples and oranges is is is, is not enough, which is why Saber is so important because it's the same material. So we really have a chance of getting somewhere with comparing Dama and Sabre made of the same material. I'm, look, I'm really excited about this, this work that you're doing. Excellent, excellent. Hey, um, Nicole, you spent a bit of time at the, uh, the big uh, particle smasher in Switzerland on the French-Swiss border, the you know, Large Hadron Collider, right? What, um, you do some work related to that? Can we, can we find dark uh, matter? Yes, I do. So yeah. the, um, you know, we we'll, we would love to detect a signal in SABRE or in one of these other dark matter direct detection experiments like Xenon, but there are other ways for looking for dark matter. And so you might hope to create dark matter particles in the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a big experiment which smashes together protons um, and looks for the interactions of those collisions. And in fact, if we if we were to see a signal in a direct detection experiment, what does that tell us? That tells us that dark matter particles interact with nuclei. If dark matter particles interact with nuclei, great, we should be able to create them. Um, and we, we would create them in, in the Large Hadron Collider. So we'd be looking for interactions in which the two protons come together, collide, and in the, in the products of that collision, uh, dark matter particles would be there. How do you see that? Because dark matter particles are, are dark and, you know, don't interact. They get out of the detector, they're invisible. Um, so those collider searches are actually looking for something that's missing. So you, you've got some, you've produced some dark matter particles, you've probably produced something as well. And you and you analyze what it is that you do see and you, you look for something that wasn't there. So, so you, like you, you, you look at the conservation of energy and momentum and you say, I smashed my particles this way and I saw something going that way and there should have been something going in the opposite direction to balance it out, but there wasn't. And that doesn't make sense. That can't be. So there must have been some invisible particles that we created in our collisions. And, um, and have you found any of, of those? Of course, yet? there are other invisible particles that we know and love, like neutrinos. Um, but you can work out if, if you're creating something we already know about, like neutrinos, or in fact, there were more particles that went missing. Um, they call, it's, it's a 
missing transverse energy searches is what it's called. Um, but yeah, you're, you're smashing together these protons and you're looking for something that went missing and you're analysing whether you could have created dark matter. Okay, we're, we're talking about sort of WIMPs here, right? Axions is a different detection method, is that right? Lindsay, yeah, no, the, in, in, in those big particle colliders, we're looking for WIMPs. Yeah. Can you tell me about yeah, the axions, so, so with axions, yeah, I mean, so it's a different signal with an axion detector. I mean, as Katie said, they're, they're very light. So they're sort of trillions of times lighter than, than WIMPs. And so we needed, there's no possible way you could ever look for a nuclear recoil. And that's not how they interact anyway. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a you know, the theory of axions predicts that um, axions can actually convert into photons um, and they, they, they can kind of be induced to convert into photons if you have a strong magnetic field as well. So the axon experiments tend to try and look for photons appearing in their detector out of nowhere. Um, so, the, so the axion, you know, catching an axion, essentially converting into a photon. And so what they do um, is they build these, these really, really ultra sensitive antennae, essentially, um, you know, electromagnetic cavities that um, are very finely tuned to look for a very specific frequency. Um, and then they cool it down close to absolute zero to get rid of, of the thermal noise that you would otherwise not be able to see, you know, very weak um, signals of, of, you know, maybe one axion appearing in your detector. Uh, and then, you know, they, they put this in a big magnetic field and then they shield it um, from, you know, all the other electromagnetic radiation they could come across. Um, and then they just essentially try and tune in, right? So they can tune the frequency of this uh, resonant cavity and try and tune in to the, to the axion frequency. So it's, a, it's uh, literally like a, a radio, right? Trying to, trying to look for the axion at different, at different frequencies. Sounds like a, a tricky experiment as well. Hey, look, what, what I put it, and maybe Katie, is, I mean, this is all about trying to find this mysterious missing matter. But could it be the case that the theory of gravity needs a bit of adjusting? I mean, after all, Einstein sort of adjusted Newton's theory of gravity. Could it be that what's the trick is these galaxies are spinning and they're staying together, not because of extra mass, but because the equations of gravity are actually different on the large scale that we don't know about. Is that a possibility? Would you like to talk about that, Katie? Sure. So I'm going to give you my answer right away, which is no. There's too much evidence on all different observational sites. We've told you some of it, but there's a lot more. So dark matter really seems to be there. So then people, yes, there's a theory called MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, and that people tried the idea that, well, as you move away from the center of the galaxies, you get farther and farther out. Things are less, their acceleration's lower, and maybe Newton's laws have to be modified when you get to low accelerations. And you're able, they were able to explain rotation curves with that. But then you really want that's that's kind of that's kind of a hand wavy thing. You want a fundamental model that does that, and people do have that now. But in order to make it work, they have to have not just they have to add more new particles. So they they have to add this. There's like the Tevis theory. They have to add tensors and scalars, and you know what? They still need the dark matter to get the CM the cosmic microwave background right. Mm -hmm. So it's just on, on, I I think especially on these large scales of the of the universe as a whole with this. This, this leftover light from the Big Bang, nobody's arguing with dark matter anymore. Now, on the smallest scales of the galaxies with the rotation curves, sure, maybe you could still do something with that. But on the, in the big picture, you really do need dark matter. Would it, would it be the case that, you know, back in the early days when we didn't have quite so much evidence that that idea that modifying gravity might have held, but now as we've acquired more evidence, there's just so many adjustments that have to be made they're untenable at the moment? Are there people that still believe that it could be modified gravity? Well, I think you described it really well. We just keep getting more and more data that uh, that show you that it's that these modified gravity models on their own are not going to work. So especially the, the, the CMB, especially the cosmic microwave background, there's just really not a single theory that's able to pull it off outside of dark matter. Yeah. So it's so it's it's tantalizing, isn't it? We you know have so much evidence; it must be there, and yet we just haven't made this detection yet. I, I imagine you guys are feeling the frustration or the challenge. Ah! 
<laughs> it's exciting. It keeps me in a job. That's nice. That's true. That's, that's true. You're not deliberately hiding the results to keep you in a job longer, are you? <laughs> um, nope. No, if you find it, there'll be a lot more work to do. Oh, well, that's true. <laughs> um, Nicole, you, you've sort of uh, got an idea that we might be able to use neutron stars, right? So first uh, to, to detect dark matter, tell me first of all, what is a neutron star before we start? Oh, and a neutron star is the is the remnant of a of an old star after it's gone supernova, and it's it's really you know almost the densest the densest form of matter in the universe. If it, if you compress matter any more densely than in a neutron star, you'd actually have a black hole. Um, so you know. The, the reason dark matter is so hard to find is it interacts so rarely. We have these big detectors and we can talk about, you know, interaction rates, you know, one in you per day, which is teeny tiny signal to go and look for. And so you start to ask questions about, well, can I get a bigger detector? Where else do I have a whole bunch of nuclei that dark matter particles can interact with? And for a long time, people have thought about perhaps dark matter can, well, if dark matter interacts with nuclei, if dark matter goes through the sun, there's, a, there's some possibility that the dark matter particles will get accumulated in the sun and you build up a density of dark matter particles in the sun over time. And I know Katie has worked very much on this. Um, Another, another example of this is a, is a neutron star which collects dark matter even better than the sun does because it's just so dense. Um, and for the sorts of uh, interaction rates that we might feasibly see in detectors anytime soon. So if Lindsay's going to see anything in SABRE that tells us roughly how strong the dark matter interaction rates would be, for those sort of interaction rates, in fact, all dark matter particles that go through a neutron star would get captured, um, which is, you know, which is, which is, uh, yeah, it, a massive interaction rate. And so the scenario in which all dark matter particles go through neutron stars and get themselves captured means that the neutron star itself, you can think of as an astrophysical dark matter detector. Lindsay's got a detector in a mine in Australia, the neutron star itself you can think of as sort of nature's dark matter detector and so you can ask questions about what would this do to the star how would we pick this up would it heat the star up would it collapse the star into a black hole um and based upon having seen or not seen some of these things you can start to say something about how strongly dark matter particles interact so that so in, in principle a, a neutron star could be full of dark matter right if it's all going in and not coming out it's unlikely to be full of dark matter. That would require some very extreme uh, dark matter model. Uh, just a teeny tiny fraction, though, would, would be enough to, to do something interesting. And, and has some observations begun to see if some of this pans out? Well, you know, certainly we know that neutron stars exist out there that haven't been collapsed to black holes because they've gobbled up too much dark matter. So that already tells you something. And if if dark matter accumulates in, in neutron stars to any considerable extent, then in fact, when the dark matter hits the neutron star, it, it um, transfers energy to the star and it can heat the star up. And so you can go and try and measure the temperature of neutron stars um, and, and see if it agrees with, with, with what you think or not and if there could be something going on with dark matter. Ah, interesting. I'll look out for the results on that one. Uh, Lindsay, what, what are some of the other experiments that are coming up? I've heard of a Darwin. There's an experiment called Darwin. Can you run me through that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, this is another liquid xenon experiment. So, I mean, Darwin is probably the 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 maybe the final liquid xenon experiment that we'll run and it, it'll be you know the the current xenon one ton experiment will be uh, is, is is about one ton of of liquid xenon darwin will be 40 times bigger so it's wow. 40 tons of liquid xenon and and we'll have a similar sort of or even better actually capability to to reject backgrounds and so it'll have an even lower backgrounds than than xenon does um, but it, it may well be the last liquid xenon experiment because, you know, it's almost a victim of its own success because once you start building an experiment that is so big and so sensitive, it, it, it is then able to start seeing uh, neutrinos. So, so the sun uh, and, and various other sources uh, emit uh, neutrinos uh, and, and neutrinos are another type of particle that we normally don't have to worry about 
in sort of particle detectors until we get to very big, very sensitive experiments because they also interact via the weak force and so they interact very weakly. Um, and so Darwin will, will um, maybe start to measure these uh, solar neutrinos uh, and then if we build an even bigger detector, then we'll, we'll just see even more. And so rather than our backgrounds decreasing as we as we go to bigger and bigger experiments, our, our backgrounds really won't decrease at all. We'll start seeing more and more of these neutrinos. And so this, this effect is known as the neutrino flaw. And so this is a, a, a challenge that, you know, the field faces in the in the coming years is how we can overcome this neutrino flaw. And so um, one of the experiments I'm working on actually is is a directional detector called Cygnus that that is hoping to do just that to, to try and come up with a way to uh, overcome the the neutrino flaw. Were you keen to say something there Katie? You're very excited at the, the mention of neutrino flaw. Yeah, I, 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 I was exactly going to say what uh, Lindsay was saying which is if you can see the direction particles are coming from then you can go below the neutrino floor because we, we saw that picture of the, that because the sun's moving around the galaxy, you get this wind of wimps coming at you. And that, the, that wind is coming from the direction of, of Cygnus, right? This, this, Cygnus is a constellation, right? So that, uh, that's why your experiment's called Cygnus, because if you're able to see these things coming from that direction, that's not neutrinos from the sun, that's dark matter. So the, the next wave of experiments has to have this directionality and it's super exciting if you're able to do that. So at the moment, yeah, the, yeah, at the it's moment, be... just the, the uh, dark matter particles can be coming from any kind of direction. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the current wind detectors don't tell you anything about the direction of the particle, but uh, the Cygnus the Cygnus type detectors can. So you can measure the 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 actual. You can measure the direction that the recoiling nucleus took in the detector, and from that you can infer the directionality of the particle that caused it, so the dark matter or the neutrino. And and so you can either point back towards the sun. And, and say, well, that was the solar neutrino, or you can point towards Cygnus uh, and say, well, that was, that was probably dark matter. So it's, a, it's another tool that we have in our arsenal. It's incredible work. It really is quite you know, mind boggling how you can actually do this. But you know, the theory as well as the you know, experiments, it's quite a remarkable area. Uh, are both of these new experiments going underground in Italy as well, or anything more for Australia? So Cygnus will be uh, a, a multi-site experiment. So you, to do this directional measurement, you actually need to do it with a gas detector, which is which is bananas because it means that you're then reducing your detector's density by you know a factor of a thousand or so. So you need a detector that's about a thousand times as big to be able to do the measurement that a, a, a solid detector could do. And so um, we're gonna we're gonna do this uh, by putting it in a number of underground labs. Um, um, so there's, there's, you know, Australia, Japan, the US, the UK, Italy are all going to host a, a Cygnus detector. And, and ultimately, what we aim to do is build a detector that's around a thousand cubic meters. Um, and, and that would be, you know, when you put together the data from all these detectors that are located around the world, form one sort of giant networked detector. Fascinating. We're going to wind up very soon. But one last question to each of you. Katie, I'll start with you. So when are we going to find it? What's your tip? If I'm putting some money on this, what's, what's your tip I should back? Yeah, why do you have to start with me? <laughs> you know, I, I've, been, I, I've, I've answered this one incorrectly for a long time. I've always said, oh, it's in the next decade. And so I'll say it again, within the next decade. I'm not a funding body here. You can tell me whatever you like. Yeah. <laughs> okay, within the next decade. Uh, Nicole? Oh, this this year is just a guess, you know. The, 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 after Xenon Montan, which is the leading one at the moment, there's going to be something called Darwin, which is even bigger, better version of Xenon Montan, which will get all the way down to the to the neutrino floor, you know. Within, you know, I guess the time scale is about a decade, so it would be really nice to to reach it at that point. If it's beyond a decade and we have to wait for Cygnus, oh, I reckon it's more like thirty years. <laughs> Okay, well, here's, no. here's, the, here's the man who might know. I'm going okay. to put 100 bucks on this, so I want some good advice. Funding for Cygnus. <laughs> what, what do you reckon, uh, Lindsay? Look, I mean, I, I would like to be optimistic and, and say, you know, let's, let's, let's measure it in the next decade as well. Uh, I mean, I think 
we're exploring with so many different detectors. Um, you know, we're not just looking for WIMPs, we're looking for axions, we're looking for low mass WIMPs. And so I think there's, we're searching under every rock that we can. And so I, you know, I hope it'll be in the next decade. Well, good luck to you all. It's been a fascinating chat. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank Hope you, you really enjoyed thank that. Uh, it was, I found it fascinating and uh, a really uh, interesting topic. And, you know, maybe it will only be a decade. See you later.